What are you? I don't mean categorically, as in you're a human, but literally and physically. Which things taken together make you up? Your hands are surely a part of you, but what about your hair and nails? How about the shirt you're wearing, the hammer you hold, or the car you drive? Research suggests that we have a very complex and flexible system of self-identification. It seems that which things we consider a part of our bodies depends on a combination of what can be called top-down and bottom-up information. Your knowledge that you have two hands and they look a certain way is an example of top-down information. If you see a hand that looks like yours at the end of your arm, you might infer that it belongs to you, even if it's paralyzed or numb. The bottom-up information is composed of all those sensations of touch and temperature and muscle tension that you receive from your hand. Even if you somehow forgot that you had hands, you might figure out that the thing you see being touched by a sweater as you feel the texture of a sweater against you is you. Our brains appear to use both of these sources of knowledge to actively keep track of which things are a part of us. Most of us have had the experience of driving a car or riding a bike and discovering that we have an intuitive sense of our new size, and we can judge whether we'll fit through gaps pretty easily. These are very adaptive abilities, and they play a central role in the human use of tools. But like any other system, our sense of body ownership can be fooled or break down. You may have experienced falling asleep with your arm under you, and waking up with that panicky feeling of someone else's hand lying beside you. When your hand falls asleep, those bottom-up signals it normally sends to your brain stop coming, and it's possible for you to become momentarily confused about whether or not it's actually your hand. There's a less dangerous way to explore this sort of thing than cutting off circulation to parts of your body, by actively feeding your brain misleading sensations. The most widely known example of this is the rubber hand illusion. You lay your hand next to a fake rubber one, hidden behind a partition so you can't see it. Someone else then uses paintbrushes to stroke both hands simultaneously and they match the movements carefully so that you feel your hand being touched, where and how you see the rubber hand being touched. The result is a compelling fake of normal bottom-up signaling. Just like the sweater example, you feel a paintbrush on your skin as you see one touching the rubber hand, so the rubber hand must be yours. After about a minute of this, many people will begin to feel that the rubber hand is their hand. They still know rationally that it isn't, But the bottom-up sensations seem to be overwhelming that top-down knowledge of the hand's fakeness. Simply having a hand, being physically connected to it by your arm, doesn't necessarily result in a sensation of ownership. And conversely, being completely physically disconnected from something isn't enough to keep you from feeling like it's a part of you. That seemingly fundamental experience of having physical parts is actually the result of some kind of subconscious reasoning that happens actively over time. The rubber hand illusion is just one way to mess with this system. Another variant you can try with a friend is called the Pinocchio effect. You sit behind your friend with your eyes closed and run a finger along your own nose. At the same time, use your other hand to reach up and run a finger along your friend's nose. Some people will begin to feel that their nose has grown very long, as their brain gets the impression that they're feeling the touch of their extended hand on the tip of their own nose. Another example is the rubber finger illusion, which uses a single movable finger rather than a whole hand. I created this device to allow people to experience it on their own. When you strap your finger into these straps down here, your movements are translated to the rubber finger. You can go left, right, up, and down. And when your real finger touches this lower shelf here, the rubber finger touches the top shelf. This way you're able to feel the contact you see between the rubber finger and the shelf as you move the finger around. A majority of the friends I've tried this on have reported strange feelings of ownership over this rubber finger. To me it starts to feel like my finger might be inside of a rubber glove or something. I know it's not my skin I'm looking at, but somehow it really feels like my finger is there inside of it. In what's perhaps the most extreme version of these so-called body transfer illusions, Researchers have actually managed to produce a full out-of-body experience in the lab. They had subjects wear virtual reality headsets, showing live footage from two cameras placed a few feet behind them, one camera for each eye. A researcher used one hand to touch their chests with a plastic rod, while at the same time moving another rod beneath the cameras. 
This way the subjects saw their own bodies from behind, in full 3D, and felt a rod touching their chests as they saw a rod move below their field of view. So after about two minutes, there were significant reports of subjects feeling they had moved out of their bodies and were occupying the space of those cameras. This is pretty incredible and has potentially staggering implications for the effectiveness of virtual reality technology. I'd love for you guys to play around and see if you can come up with any other ways to explore these body transfer illusions. Let me know in the comments. I'm sure there are plenty of unexplored effective ways of doing this. These effects generally work best with similar looking close by imposter body parts and using perfectly matched stimulation. That being said, they seem to be quite flexible in some surprising ways. If you lift the brush used to touch the rubber hand so that it never actually makes contact, some people will report feeling supernatural sensations, like being touched by an invisible extension of the brush, or maybe some kind of force field generated by it. Even the shape and appearance of the rubber hand can be dramatically off, with some reports of subjects feeling like cardboard boxes or even flat tabletops are their hands. So what is this feeling of ownership? Is it purely a psychological thing, or does it have physical implications for the ways our bodies function too? Well, it turns out that during the illusion, the disowned body part actually cools significantly and shows a higher histamine reactivity. This suggests that the immune system may be involved in the illusion too, effectively beginning to treat the part as more foreign. Manipulations of apparent size can change people's skin sensitivity too. Something as simple as looking at a hand that's in pain through backwards binoculars can reduce the pain's intensity, while looking through a magnifying glass can improve its sensitivity to touch. There doesn't seem to be a clean and simple distinction here between the mental and physical components of self-perception. This may all sound like something you'd only find in lab settings, but it actually turns out there's a group of people for whom these illusions are commonplace, amputees. A large proportion of patients with amputated limbs, maybe 80% or more, report vivid feelings of a continued presence of their missing limb. This is known as phantom limb syndrome. The lingering sensations from these phantom body parts can be benign or even pleasant, like tingling or warmth, but patients can also experience constant, inescapable sensations of cramping, burning, twisting pain. These sensations are incredibly convincing, some even reporting they can feel their phantom fingernails digging into their palms. Somehow the loss of bottom-up feedback from their missing limb has resulted in a runaway failure of self-perception. This group of patients with cramping spasms in their phantom limbs has benefited immensely from a clever solution devised by Dr. V. S. Ramachandran. He basically had patients straddle a mirror and look down into it so that the reflections of their intact limbs appeared where they felt their phantom limbs were. They were then told to imagine moving both of them in gentle, symmetrical patterns so they could have the impression of seeing their phantom limbs act out the movements they were commanding them to make. His first subject in 1993 was an upper arm amputee who had been experiencing nearly continuous, terrible pains in his phantom for 11 years. Moments into the exercise, he reported relief from the pain and the wonderful sensation of his phantom arm moving again, for the first time since his amputation years before. After several sessions of this treatment, his phantom elbow and forearm disappeared entirely, along with the pain he'd been feeling in them. He was left with phantom fingers dangling from his shoulder, a bizarre but somewhat common experience for phantom limb sufferers, and a dramatic improvement over his previous condition. This is an amazingly non-invasive, low-tech treatment, which seems to be more effective than many past approaches involving surgery and drugs. Research into the clinical applications of these effects continues today, and I'm really excited to see how recent advances in virtual reality technology will also be used to further explore the nature of human body perception.